say, hi, I'm Lise Colucci, and I'm one of the life coaches at Queen Being. Today, I'm talking to Paul Weinfield, and I'm really excited because he has a lot to say and some really great, amazing words in his book here, which I'll talk about. And as far as mindfulness goes, I feel like he is a person that I personally look to daily for guidance in that arena. So, um, hi, Paul. Hi. How are you today? Doing well. I'm Good. Doing well. Thank you. I wanted to first talk about your book, which is called The Magpie Art, Gathering the Brightness of Every Day. And it literally does gather brightness in your day to read, like what, it's written in small passages. And so you can go through this kind of at your leisure and as things come to you. It's been an amazing book. Thank you so much for putting it all in one place for us. <laughs> I appreciate those yeah. kind words. Yeah, and, and you can find it on Amazon anywhere really, right? bookstores yeah. yeah yeah and I will I'll read a bit from it later when I find a passage on another video um, but I wanted to get Paul talking here and ask you about mindfulness itself what is it for people who have never experienced practice with it well so mindfulness is used in a lot of different ways in our culture um, I'm going to talk about how I think the Buddha intended it mm -hmm. um, but there are different meanings of the word uh, a lot of times in our culture, we use mindfulness to mean like being very slow or being very into what we're doing, like, you know, mindfully washing the dishes or mindfully eating. Uh, and those are important things to do to be more present. Um, but the way the Buddha taught it is mindfulness is a kind of memory. It's remembering what's important at any moment, right? Mm -hmm. so remembering basically what you need to do in order to be happy at any moment. So mindfulness can mean anything from just simply being mindful of like, you know, you go into a meeting with somebody and you're nervous, you know, so mindfulness could be like, just remember to breathe or just remember to, you know, that this is not the end of the world, or that this will pass. So any of those things could be mindfulness. It's reminding yourself mm -hmm. of what you need to do. Now in meditation, when we talk about mindfulness, we talk about mindfulness of breath because it's really hard to do any of the other kinds of remembering, remembering mm -hmm. what's important what you need to do to be happy if you don't have an anchor you know mm -hmm. in other words if you get up into your thoughts up into your head next thing you know you're spinning out of control and you have no idea what's important you're just kind of getting back into the same patterns of self-hatred anxiety whatever so what we do in meditation is we practice mindfulness of breathing which is remembering to keep the breath in mind right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we tell ourselves literally softly but silently um, focus on the breath stay with the breath stay with the breath and as you develop that with the breath, not only do you start to have an anchor and a refuge in the breath, but you also have that strength of mind. You have that ability to keep your mind on one thing and you can apply that to all kinds of things in your life. So you might be meeting with somebody who has hurt you and what you might be using mindfulness for is just to remember that you have a safe place inside, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever is going on outside, you have a safe place inside. You might be doing this at the dentist or at the doctor or at the post office, right? So you can apply that skill wherever you like, but you have to develop it first because it is a muscle. And mm -hmm. if you haven't developed mindfulness, what's going to happen is as soon as something that is traumatic or triggering happens, it's going to pull you away from what you have told yourself so many times is important. You know, so it's easy to tell somebody, um, you know, oh, you're good enough or just love yourself or, you know, any of these things. But if we don't have the muscle to keep us focused on what's important, to keep us remembering what's important, then we're just going to slip away. Right. That, that's a really great explanation. Thank you. Because I think a lot of times we tell people just breathe, just breathe, but really why, why just breathe? And you just explain, you know, as an anchor, it's not to distract you or to take you away from what you're feeling, what you're feeling is real and it's right there yeah. and it, but it also passes. And yeah. instead of clinging to what we feel, we can anchor onto the breath. Yeah, is, that, yeah. is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. And you know, as you develop mindfulness, one of the cool things you get to do is you get to be the one to choose what you focus on. So sometimes that might mean you actually want to focus on, you know, if you're getting triggered, you might want to focus on the pain because that's mm -hmm. something you might have to look at. If it's too overwhelming though, if your mindfulness is strong, you can tell yourself, no, I don't want to go there right now. I want to put my mind on something else. So the freedom to put your mind on what you choose is such an important part of, you know, being happy and feeling safe in this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that the anchoring back to feeling safe inside. And I think a lot of people, when we're talking about narcissistic abuse survivors in particular, that's lost. 
if it was right. ever there to begin with for them. And I think for people in general, that's not there to begin with for a lot of us, you know, even regardless of the traumas we've had. So I like that that can build in um, that safe space inside. Um, and then when I think about your book here, a lot of the words, when I read the words in your book, I come back to that exact practice as I'm reading and mm -hmm. it lets me let in the ideas that you're presenting. Yeah. And also for anything in life, you know, as I let things in when I'm um, being more mindful in the yeah. moment, I'm not actually slowing down. And I mean, I have a hard time with that, <laughs> that kind of mindfulness. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. The, the more active kind is what you're talking about. Like you can actually take this into your whole entire life once you yeah. build the muscle. Right. Exactly. Okay. The other metaphor that I use in the book is of like a tattoo artist, you know, like mm -hmm. how a tattoo is ink, but it's ink that's gotten under your skin. Right. Mm -hmm. And we have all these messages that are very positive, but without mindfulness, they don't get under our skin. You know, it's like you can write, I love myself on your arm, but it's going to wash off very quickly. Mm -hmm. But if you remind yourself that you love yourself and you feel the breath and you learn how to be mindful of the breath, those messages will really start to sink in. You'll start to feel them on a more felt level, on a more kind of bodily level. You right. Know, um, no, that, that's a great, those are great explanations. Thank you. And then mm -hmm. as far as, um, Abuse survivors, people with PTSD in particular, is there anything that you'd add to what you just said? Um, I mean, you, you touched on it a little bit, but is there any more that you would say about um, what, if, what if breath triggers you? What if like, right. you feel anxious or, you know, like, go, go ahead, start with that. Okay. No, that's a really good question because I think, unfortunately, you know, a lot of people who are trauma survivors go to study meditation and they're just kind of thrown on the deep end of the pool. People just say, just feel your breath. Feeling breath is really important in the long run, mm -hmm. but you know, it's the breath is kind of a trap door. The more concentration you get, the more it's going to, it's going to open up stuff that is from the past mm -hmm. and you have to know how to deal with that. And the, the basic rule of thumb is that you always want to be able to put any thought or experience to the side temporarily. You know, eventually mm -hmm. you want to get into that stuff. You want to look at it so that you can really uproot it and you can really be liberated from it. But the rule of thumb is that as soon as it starts to get overwhelming, you need somewhere else to go. Okay. So what does that mean? Literally, um, if feeling the breath at one point is actually causing you to get more triggered, then you'd want to drop the perception of the breath and go somewhere else. Uh, when I say go somewhere else, it could mean focusing on your hands or your feet. You mm -hmm. know, it could mean that those are very grounding ways of looking at your body or feeling your body. Um, you can really feel the breath, not just at your nostrils, but anywhere in the body. And the body's kind of like a map, you know? So when we have traumas, they get kind of caught in different parts of the body. So mm -hmm. if you trip over a tripwire in some part of the body, you're going to feel that, but you can always go to another part of the body. Right. right? So you can focus on your hands or your feet. Um, you can open your eyes. You don't have to be in formal meditation. You can go for a walk. I mean, there's so many tools for dealing with trauma. So basically you could, you only bite off as much as you can handle at a time. You know, and our tendency is we want the whole to bite off the whole thing because we want to fix it. We want to get rid of it. We want to move on to the next thing. We want to be free from trauma. But that's how we re-traumatize ourselves. Exactly. That's great. And because I, I want people to understand that if it is a trigger for your breath, that there are other ways and that not to dismiss the breath for later on, that it's just yeah. a trigger right now. And as you build muscles, then and you learn what the breath actually means. It doesn't mean hyperventilating and it doesn't mean you know, over focusing on in and out, in and out, in and out, it can mean a whole lot of things. Like, exactly. Right. Totally. Okay. And can yeah, you say a little bit about walking meditations? I've, I've talked to people about that who can't sit still and they think yeah. it would be dangerous for them. So, um, uh, dangerous in what way? Uh, just that it would be, they'd be so distracted that they'd walk into something or, you know, walk into traffic or I, my, my suggestion oh. is usually go into nature and kind of like yeah. move slower and be more present. So is it really about being present? to what's around you? Traditional walking meditation um, is not really going for a walk, it's picking a path, you know, mm -hmm. and the way it's practiced in, in Theravada Buddhist countries like Thailand or Burma or places mm -hmm. like that. Um, it's picking a path and you walk back and forth. So you keep your eyes open, but you know the path, so you're not gonna bump into anything. Mm -hmm. um, in New York City, most New York City's apartment, where I live, most New York City apartments so don't really have a lot of room to do walking meditation. Um, but you can, you can do, you can just pick a small lane and walk back and forth. And generally what you'd be doing is focusing on your breath somewhere lower in the body. So like probably in your belly more than, you know, at your nostrils or whatever, just to give you a sense of grounding and you keep your mm -hmm. eyes open 
you walk back and forth. And the point of it is to take the skills that you practice in seated meditation and try to put them into motion mm-hmm. so that you have a sense of what it would be like to be mindful of your breath, to be present in daily life. Um, now, that's different from just going for a walk, which I think is a great thing to do too. I think you know, going for a walk once a day is really important for just mental health. Um, right. But going for a walk is more casual. Right. I've read a couple of your posts on Facebook about walking and you have mentioned bringing mindfulness into um, a walking practice, which isn't the same thing as what you're talking about here, because that's more of a like a formal walking meditation. Um, So I think that is more what I would offer to people, you know, that at least where they're at now, because a lot of people do need to get out and move their body with trauma and stress. You just got to get out of that stagnant position and move. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I mean, this a lot of, could help, I guess. Right? Sorry. Go, I said that could help to um, learning to bring the mindfulness into your day, but also into a very specific time of day where you set aside self-care to walk. Set aside, yeah. Okay. I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of what we call emotions, mm-hmm. as I said, they're located in the body and their, their energies or, you know, if that word seems too mystical, just That's basically, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, 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 they're felt experiences that, that want to move. Mm-hmm. And really when you get more skilled at seated meditation, you can let the, those energies move just while you're sitting. You know, you can have the perception that they're flowing out your hands or your feet or, you know, so you can really kind of work with that. But in the beginning, when your, your powers of concentration are not that strong, um, sometimes, you know, you just, if you're feeling triggered or traumatized, you just, yeah, you just need to get up and move. And, you know, I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm someone who's suffered a lot of trauma and a lot of it is I've healed, you know, even before I studied meditation, I just, I healed a lot of it or I soothed a lot of it. I'll say it that way. Um, just by learning to, to walk a lot. And I walk like six miles a day still. Um, I just think it's so important to, um, to have a, the perception that you're moving and that the things in you are moving, you know, it reminds you that like these things aren't permanent. They move, mm-hmm. you know, come, mm-hmm. they go, they pass away. Um, and walking really kind of is a very easy way to get a sense of that. Right. And and plus you get the stimulation and the experience of life around you, not just your own little encapsulated trauma going on. Totally. Yeah. Totally. yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. That's lovely. So one thing I would say, and, this might be a little controversial, but um, but I feel I should say it anyways. If you have a history of trauma, yeah. If you have a, if you have a history of trauma, be really careful about going on retreats. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a sort of retreat tradition that came out of the '60s and '70s where people would just be like, "Oh, just you know, go, go for ten days, be silent, and you'll just like work it all out. You'll purge it." You know, a lot of times people re-traumatize them to that. Um, I also personally believe that it's re- it's really important if you get serious about meditation, uh, period. But if you if you have especially if you have trauma to to work with a teacher, I mean, you need somebody who is able to look at you and say, "You're going too deep. You got to come up." You know, you, you know. I mean, that uh, there have been times when my own teacher was able to do that, and I was like, you know, I was totally unaware that I was in the deep end of the pool. I was I was just thinking I was getting nowhere. And he's like, "You're in way too deep." You got to come, you got to come out. And what he meant by that is take a walk, eat some heavier food, you know, skip a meditation period or whatever. Um, It's really hard to know when you're in it, you know, that's part of being triggered is that when you're triggered, you you don't realize you're being triggered. You just kind of, you know, are in the state that you don't, can't fully articulate. So it's really important to work with somebody. Right. That's a good, that's a good thought, especially if people are going beyond, um, five minutes a day type of things, you know, like going, going heavily into it as a form of, of healing or as a form of practice to um, work through the healing that they need to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, and, therapy is really important too. You know, I mean, it's not, there different things do different things. Right. Um, you know, there, there's an element of trauma, as I'm sure you know, and talk about that is on the level beneath words. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also really helpful to, you know, work with words in a therapy context, you know, to work with the story of your childhood or whatever, that can be very, very helpful in clearing out. It's kind of like my teacher used to say, it's like, if you're, if you're weeding a garden, it's like, you kind of have to get rid of some of the big stones first. That's sort of, to me, what talk therapy does. And then you can get into digging up the little roots, you know, which is what more what meditation can help you do. Interesting. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Yeah. A lot of people are, you know, they have therapy coaching and this would be an, what I'm hoping is an extra 
thing to help yeah. people um, have something to do for themselves. Because like mm -hmm. you said, working with a teacher, absolutely, if you decide to go deep with it. But for people, do you think that for people who say, um, maybe it would benefit everyone, right? We know it benefits everyone to, mm -hmm. to have a practice at least a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Do you feel like it's safe to do a couple times a day? What do you feel like is the limit for people? Um, um, if, if, if we're talking about like uh, people who are easily triggered, I think it's not so much how many times a day you do it. I think it's how long you sit for. Okay. So, but, you know, you could do it several times a day. I, I don't think that's a problem. I just wouldn't sit for that long if you don't have a teacher and you're not being supervised because it's usually – like, for example, I find in my own practice after about 20 minutes of meditation, mm -hmm. um, that's when stuff starts really coming up. And if if I'm triggered or if I don't really know, I mean, I've been doing this for a long, long time, but if I if I didn't know what that was, I would misinterpret it, what's, what's coming up as something that I just kind of have to, like, force my way through. Mm -hmm. And that's what you don't want to do. If you don't know what you're doing and something's coming up, you have to talk to someone or you have to stop the sitting. Right. No. If the person wanted to sit for five minutes a day, several times a day, I think that that would be fine. Okay. That's what I usually suggest to people is five to seven minutes, two to three times a day to just, because what happens in that short of an amount of time is the nervous system has a chance to slow way down. I mean, just looking at it from that level of being able to slow down your nervous system when you are so full of trauma and are um, basically coming in at life maxed out, you know, every morning you're just completely at your max and overwhelmed. So that gives it a chance to slow it down several times yeah. a day in short periods. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The other thing that I think is really important, you know, for everybody, but again, talking about trauma is, I mean, is taking actions in daily life that support, you know, mm -hmm. the healing. I mean, a lot of times we just kind of focus on the therapy of, of meditation as though it were just like a little assembly line that you go through and then you're healed. But like, things like you know who you spend time with obviously but but also things like generosity i think it's so important for mm -hmm. healing to spend time helping others um mm -hmm. it really really is to me that's not optional like i think a lot of people think it is but you know if you're not if you're not helping others then you're not really brightening your mind which means you're not you're kind of going to have a, the wrong attitude towards meditation in general right yeah, yeah. it all goes together doesn't it gratitude yeah. gratitude is that Grat essential it's yeah. essential even though it's hard to do gratitude for yourself including yourself yeah. in the gratitude you know and having we, we say 10 things that you are grateful for and three things you love about yourself every day you know that's what we offer to people to try and do because it's the same thing it blends it right back into the mindfulness and that's such a beautiful i mean it's such a beautiful practice what you're saying it's also just such an example of how you build strength of mind i mean because because mm -hmm. that's what you're doing you're like yeah you can think about a million horrible things but if you're taking the time to focus on 10 things that you feel grateful for you're also developing that strength of mind to choose what you focus on you know and that's that same mindfulness that same muscle that's going to help you when you are triggered and you know obviously you don't have a, a journal or a gratitude notebook handy but you still have those those skills in your mind in those muscles right. that you've built up and then it combines with the mindfulness breathing and the right. mindfulness practices together when you're in a triggered situation or you're at the dentist or whatever you had said earlier that you know, where your mind starts going into fear or trauma, right? Exactly. Or even just everyday life and you are trying to prevent a trigger or, right. you know, you catch them. Yeah, that's yeah. great. So I'm going to ask if you wouldn't mind leading us on a meditation, a mindfulness meditation for people. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate this so much. Yeah. My pleasure. Yeah. We'll, we'll be in touch and thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you. So the first one I'm going to do is just a basic mindfulness of breathing meditation. Okay. So close your eyes. You can get yourself into a comfortable position. Don't worry too much about your posture. Just make sure your back is somewhat straight. Your hands are resting at ease. Your eyes are gently closed. And your feet are resting comfortably. Start by taking about five deep in and out breaths. And as you count five breaths, try to get your awareness into your body. So imagine that your awareness is like a balloon. 
And it's just filling up your whole body from the crown of your head all the way down to the soles of your feet. Try to make sure that there's no part of your body that isn't covered with your awareness. And then within your full body awareness, notice if there are any places that feel good right now. Maybe there's just a little bit of ease in the hands or the feet or some other part of your body. And just acknowledge that part of your experience is pleasant. Part of your experience feels safe. And bring your attention to your mind. Notice what's in your mind right now. If there are any thoughts about the past or the future, just see if you can put those to the side. And in place of those thoughts, see if you can set an intention. An intention is just reminding yourself what you're doing and why. So you can just say to yourself, what I wish for most of all is, and then fill in the blank. Peace strength, comfort, whatever. Just wish yourself well in some way. You can also keep your mind bright by just remembering maybe one or two things you feel grateful for. Maybe a good person in your life, something you're excited about. And then when you're ready, you can focus on your breath. So just pick one spot, probably the nostrils or the rise and fall of the belly. Just pick one spot and make up your mind that you're gonna stay right there. Just watching the breath come in and watching the breath go out. Now you'll notice that the mind only stays with the breath for a few moments and then it wanders. And that's natural. That's just what the untrained mind does. So you have to keep the mind on the breath. And that means you have to talk to yourself a bit. So finding a kind but firm tone of voice, softly and silently, you have to keep guiding yourself to the breath. Just reminding yourself, stay with the breath, Feel the breath. You can do this. Just stay right here. This is a good place. I want to stay very near to the breath like a parent walking with a child. And the child is the breath and you're the parent just hovering around the breath, keeping watch, taking good care of the breath as it comes in and goes out. And this is mindfulness, keeping the breath in mind. And you can practice mindfulness once a day, many times a day. You can even be mindful of the breath in all postures and in all parts of your day. Whenever you remember the breath, just bring your attention to it. And use your inner voice to guide yourself to the breath. And just notice the sense of ease and safety that you find in the breath. And then finally, you can take a few deep breaths again. And if any tension's gathered, breathe it away. At your own pace and in your own way. And you can open your eyes and come back into the room. <laughs>